Welcome, I am Anna Galletley and we are going to continue on with talking about the integumentary system. This particular video lecture will focus on the dermis and the accessory organs found there. Alright, so looking at our structures, we will see that we've got our epidermis up here, alright, and then the dermis is here. And then the hypodermis is here. Remember that technically the hypodermis is not part of the integumentary system. So that's the hypodermis. Okay, I'm actually going to erase this so that we can see this stuff a little better. It doesn't obscure my little pointers. Okay, all right. So we're going to divide the, um, oh, my pointers didn't extend all the way for some reason when I imported the video. But that's okay. Um, we're going to just mark this out. We have the papillary region. The papillary region is going to be right here. All right. And what you want to remember with the papillary region of the dermis is it's made out of a realer connective tissue proper. All right. It has lots of blood capillaries. All right. Remember that the epithelium has no blood vessels. It needs to stay alive, which means everything has to diffuse from the areolar region or the papillary region into the epidermis. So you have lots of blood capillaries. Pain and touch receptors. Now these little bumps right here, each one of these is called a dermal papilla. The word papilla means nipple. So they're basically little dermis nipples. So dermal papillae. And they kind of snap together with the epidermis. Now, if you take two blocks and you set them on top of each other, so think about kids' toys blocks, they're gonna slide off. Now think of Legos. Legos snap together, all right? The top snaps into the bottom of the other piece. Well, this is like Legos right here. They snap together, all right? Now, you can't tell, but within these, there's additional ridging, okay, on the dermal papillae. That creates what we call dermal ridges or epidermal ridges, and these are what forms the fingerprints on your hands and feet, okay? Now the next area is going to be the reticular region, and this is composed of dense irregular connective tissue proper. You will notice that this is the bulk of the tissue. This is all about making sure your skin doesn't tear, so no tear. The papillary region is all about keeping epidermis alive. All right, they are structurally slightly different for that reason, okay? And we'll talk more about that on the next slide or two. All right, so here we're looking at a photomicrograph what I really like is the way they've drawn the lines in here. So you see right here the stratified squamous epithelium of the epidermis. You can see really nicely where the basement membrane is, okay? Each one of these areas is a dermal papilla. And then they drew a nice line right here to distinguish between the papillary region and the reticular region, okay? Now remember, this is going to be a realer connected tissue proper, and this is going to be dense, irregular connective tissue proper. So what is the difference? Well, if you look at a realer and dense regular, they look exactly the same, except the collagen fibers in reticular and dense irregular are much, much thicker. This has collagen fibers, and they're going in different directions. This has collagen fibers and they're going in different directions. Thick fibers, thin fibers. So because the fibers in the dermal papilla, or in the papillary region are thinner, there's a lot more room for all of these beautiful blood capillaries going all over the place. Not a lot of room down here for capillaries. There's just not room because the fibers are there. Down here, this is going to prevent tearing, but this would not be a good place to do a lot of diffusion of gases. Up here, good place to do diffusion of gases 
from blood vessels in here up into the epidermis because there's lots of space for those blood capillaries and there's lots of fluid for the diffusion to go through. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so here's a slide where I summarize the different types of glands. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time. These should have indented. They go with the sebaceous gland, okay? And then you've got the sweat gland. These are the two types of sweat glands that we're gonna be looking at, eccrine and apocrine. Okay, and as we go through the pictures, I am going to talk about them, but this has the, the background information for you. All right, let's start with their sebaceous glands. Right here, I have a hair follicle, okay? Around the hair follicle, I have these little bags that I think kind of look like saddle bags hanging on either side of a horse. These are called sebaceous glands, okay? And they secrete an oily sebum, and sebum is a mix of oil and dead skin cells. All right, and this basically lubricates and waterproofs your skin and hair. Okay, also attached, so this is your hair follicle. Also attached to that hair follicle right here is what is called erector pili muscle. This is smooth muscle when it contracts, it causes your hairs to stand up on end, basically creating goosebumps. All right, I forgot the word muscle right there. Okay, so smooth muscle. Then you've got... All right, all right, so this, now we're going to look at sudoriferous glands, and we have two major kind, eccrine and apocrine. All right, when you think of sweat on your body that's wet and that cools you off, you're thinking of eccrine glands, all right? Apocrine glands secrete a sweat solution that's very thick and full of proteins and fat, and basically um, th there are sex secretions, sex glands. They're only found in the anogenital region and in your axilla, okay? Um, now. What is different about the sebaceous versus the sudoriferous glands? The sebaceous glands right here, we looked at this already, they secrete their product into the hair follicle. The product is sebum, which is a mix of oil and shattered cells. In contrast, I'm gonna erase some of this blue so that we can see it better. Whoops, that's the wrong button. Oh, it didn't work. Where is it? There it is, okay. All right. So I'm erasing some of that so we can see better. Now, the sweat gland is gonna start as a tube. It's like this. And then it's gonna come around and it's gonna have a tube that's gonna come up through the epidermis and it's gonna come out onto the skin in its own pore. So this is oil from sebum and this is sweat. So pseudoriferous gland gets its own duct. Oil from a sebaceous gland comes out with your hair follicle. So over here is another sudoriferous gland, okay? Over here is another sudoriferous gland. In contrast, so here's the oil coming out with the hair. Here is the oil coming out with the hair, okay? So they are structurally really quite different, okay? All right, let's move on to the next slide. Actually, let me add one more thing. So eccrine, what I want you to remember in terms of function is it cools you off. It's for thermoregulation. Apocrine, I want you to think sex, pheromones. Okay, these actually only become functional after we go through puberty. All right, now we're gonna go on to the next slide. All right, this slide is going to um, summarize the different touch receptors that we're gonna look at on the next couple of pictures. I'm not gonna read this to you, but you can read it yourself when you need to reference it. All right, so now we're gonna look at touch receptors. Now, we have already looked at one type of touch receptor. It was located in the epidermis and the stratum basale. There is no example here, so I'm just gonna make one. So it would have been there, and that is your Merkel cell. And that is a light touch receptor, but only when you've got hair, okay? So in hairy areas, and it's located in the epidermis. 
Now, this is a little wonky because we are going to look at a Meissner's corpuscle, which is a light touch receptor in hairless air areas, and they are only located within the dermal papilla. This is a little confusing because I've got hairs here. So technically, I shouldn't be able to see a Meissner's corpuscle, but whoever made the picture decided to put it on there with hair. So the Meissner's corpuscle is located right there. It's always in the dermal papilla, and you've got the, the neuron that attaches to it, okay? Um, let's see, what else are you gonna find? Oh, free nerve endings, which also aren't pictured in this thing. So right here, I'm just gonna draw a few. They'll snake up into here. They're really thin and tiny, okay? And they basically detect pain, and they are also located in the dermal papilla. All right, now let's go on to some of the bigger ones. We've got our Pacinian corpuscle, deep pressure and vibration. So the M's, so M and M, they do light touch, so that's a caress. P for pressure, Pacinian is for pressure. They are located deeper in the dermis. To me, they look like tree rings. Have you ever seen a tree ring picture where they've cut off a tree trunk? Um, when you feel um, music in your body. So like you can't hear the music, but you can feel someone's bass in the car next to you. That's what's picking it up is the Pacinian corpuscle. So you have that in the dermis. You also have that in other organs in the body, like the pancreas has some really nice Pacinian corpuscles in it. Now finally, my favorite, the root hair plexus. Now these are little neur neuronal innings that are going to come up here and they're gonna wrap around the hair bulb. They do not move, do not move anything. Do not get that confused with the erector pili muscle. The erector pili muscle moves the hair follicle. The root hair plexus moves nothing because it's not a muscle, it's a neuron, all right? What it does is it detects bending hairs. So say I've got a little bug here, one, two, three, four, five, six, can you see the six legs? There's the happy face, all right? It's moving my hair. It's not touching my skin, but it's moving my hair. I know it's moving my hair because the root hair plexus is telling my brain that it's moving my hair. All right, next slide. All right, so right here, we're gonna look at a Meissner's corpuscle. So we've got the epidermis. We have the papillary region right here. About right here, I can see the shift into thicker collagen here. So this is going to be the reticular layer with dense irregular. This is going to be the papillary layer with um, a realer, okay? These things right here are the dermal papillae. So that's one dermal papilla singular. Here's another one. There's another dermal papilla, okay? Now in this dermal papilla, so that's a dermal papilla as well, I can see this thing that's going back and forth kind of like a ladder, and that's your Meissner's corpuscle. Isn't that cool? All right, next slide. All right, here's a slide of a Pacinian corpuscle. This is technically from the pancreas because it just happens to be a lot easier to see. No, it is not from the pancreas. I apologize. This is so not the pancreas, and I know it's not the pancreas because look, I have sweat glands. It's a sweat gland, no sweat glands in the pancreas, that would be really gross. All right, so here you can see the rings of the Pacinian corpuscle. Do not get this confused with an osteon in bone, because it's not, it's a Pacinian corpuscle. All right, next slide. All right, this slide is just summarizing the different parts to the hair that I want you to know. So we've got the structures and we've got the functions. All right, and again, don't ever say, oh, it just does protection. Say what it does. It protects you from burning your skin from light, uh, UV light radiation. Or if you get hit on the head, it hurts a lot less if you have hair. Like, for example, me versus my husband. If I hit my head, I'm less likely to bleed, whereas he hits his head on the top of the shed, there's blood everywhere because there's no hair to protect the skin of his head, Okay. Um, also, insulation in humans doesn't work so well because we don't have that much hair except on our head. But on dogs and cats, it works fabulous. Barrier or detection of insects, again, detection, bending hair, and then thermoregulation through the action of the erector pili muscles. When those muscles contract, they cause energy to be released. That helps warm you up. But also, if you have a lot of hair, 
it creates uh, insulation air pocket, which again works really well on dogs and cats and not so hot in humans. All right, let's look at pictures. All right, so here's a picture of hair. All right, so again, we've got our epidermis, we've got our dermis, we've got a nice piscinian corpuscle there, we've got some remnants of sweat glands there. Here is, again, the epidermis, and you can see the transition right here into a sebaceous gland, which is then going to shatter its cells and secrete its stuff in around the hair follicle. So this is the actual hair itself. So you've got the shaft up here, you've got the root, and then down here is the bulb. So there's the hair bulb. For some reason, some of my uh, things didn't show up when I moved this over. So this is the root right there. There should have been little brackets to define that. Hopefully that shows up on the PowerPoint correctly. Um, so you have that. Then the cuticle is going to be a keratinized single layer of cells. And they kind of overlap each other like this, like scales. All right, and they create a nice covering for your hair. And that's going to be the outermost layer. And then you've got the medulla, which is going to be the core of your hair. And then you've got the cortex, which is the outer part. The um, hair follicle itself is basically what's holding the hair. So it's this thing right here. So this is the hair right here. And then the, the tube, the sock that holds it is the hair follicle. Down here is the papilla which is where you're going to find the area where it's going through mitosis. All right, and then don't forget your erector pubic muscle. All right, next slide. All right, so here's a photo micrograph um, showing you the structure. So again, you see the epidermis. I see the areolar CT. I see dense irregular CT. So this is my dermis, okay? Um, the epidermis, remember, is your stratified squamous. All right, now the stratified squamous is going to come up and it's going to fold down and create the sock, which is the follicle, and that's going to continue down and that's going to wrap around the actual hair. So there is the hair itself. All right, and then the hair bulb is going to come down here, right about there is where you're going to go through mitosis. One of the things I like is you can really see nicely the sebaceous gland right here. Now do you notice how these cells are all stacked on top of each other? These cells shatter and then they secrete the oil inside of themselves plus their little dead bits of cell into and around the hair follicle. So this is all a stratified, stratified cuboidal epithelium which it has to be because these die and these go through mitosis. Okay? All right, next slide. All right, nail. I am not gonna ask you to know a lot about the nail. You've got your basic structure, skin, hair, nail, all the same stuff. The difference is going to be how heavily keratinized it is and how squished together the dead cells are. So remember, hair and nail are dead. Stratum corneum, it's an R, is also dead cells. All right, so basically right about here you're going to be going through mitosis. All of this is dead and it's going to grow out to the edge. And you can basically see the same thing here where the matrix is. You go through mitosis and then it grows out this direction. And what the nail does is it covers over the tip of this bone. This bone is a bit delicate, and you could do damage to the bone or the tip of the finger if you don't have a nail. So this nail just provides a little bit more strength for protecting that bone and protecting the tip of the finger. Plus, it's nice for digging in the dirt if you need to, and it's pretty when you put colors on it. All right, so that is the end of this particular video lecture. The next video lecture is going to be demonstrating and explaining the actual skin model and my photo micrograph slides that we use in the lab class. All right.